She said, I saw him taking the children of Israel through the wilderness. She said, I held a little a woman's little baby. And then she go on, she said, I saw Noah's ark. And she began to bring words out to me I'd never heard of. And then she went on, she said, I saw Jesus at the cross and He kissed me. And I kissed Him. And, and here's the clutcher. She said, Jesus told me, He said, I'm a 2,070 some years of age. Well, that don't match that with the Bible. She needs prayer. That's what drugs will do to you people. It'll make you think that you're having visions. It'll make you think that everything's okay. And the, the, this girl, she does have a college education. She went to school to be a school teacher, like her old man. But she got messed up in drugs. And it, it's heartbreaking. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to John, if you've got your Bibles, to John chapter 16. John chapter 16, we're going to start reading at verse, I believe it is 5. But now I go, oh, I go my way to him that shall send me. That shall, let me start that over. But now, 16 is St. John. I'll wait there to Bonnie, finds it over here. Don't you like this water sound behind you? I, could, I told him I could just lay down here and go to sleep. But my luck, I'd roll in the water. <laughs> All right. No. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not John the Epistle, but John, his main book. All right, I'm going to go ahead and start this. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you ask me, whether goeth thou? But, I, but because I have told you these things, or because I have said these things unto you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe, me, believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judged I have yet many things to say unto you but you cannot bear them how be it when he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truths Did you get that all truths for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that will he speak and he shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive a mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore say I that he shall take a mine and shall show it unto you. A little while, and ye shall see me no more. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to my Father. Jesus here is telling his disciples, I'm going to leave, boys. But, I'm going to come back, but I'm going to allow you to have something else 
in place of me that will strengthen you, that will teach you, that will bring all things. We go over back into John 14 where Jesus tells his disciples, uh, whatsoever I have said unto you, and he's going to reveal it to you. He's going to tell you. He's going to teach you all things. That's what the Holy Spirit is. It's not you're jumping up and down. I, I was teasing Brother Randy a while ago. I said, now, Randy, I don't want you to get up there and take off shouting because you may fall in the creek behind you. And I'm not going in after you. <laughs> you. You get what I'm saying? You see, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's our guider. He's our, our leader. If we allowed Him to teach us, if we allowed Him to, to guide us and, and to do the things and to bring truth to us, but a lot of our problem, we don't want truth. Have you ever tried to tell somebody something and, and you know it's truth, but they wouldn't accept it? They say, I don't believe that. Somebody told my wife the other day, said, I wouldn't believe a word your sister says. That's her sister in Arkansas. And she really don't even know the woman. All right, let's go to Monday. Brother Bill, would you come up here now? I'm going to let you read. You all making him climb over the benches. Now, if you have a comment, raise your hand. All right. Brother Bill, will you read up here? Divine Human Covenant. Just the first paragraph. What is your greatest accomplishment ever? Chances are whatever you achieved did not happen simply by rolling out of bed in the morning. If we want to achieve something worthwhile in this life, it takes time and effort. Our discipleship to Christ is no different. All right, you hear that? Discipleship in Christ. Well, we have to work. How many of you ladies yesterday fixed a good meal? Three hands? Boy, we don't have any. Four at all. Well, you know what? You had to put effort into that, didn't you? You, you had to put all the ingredients together. You had to, you may have done it by memory, but you had to pull the recipe out and look at it, make sure I'm putting the right ingredients in. Well, when we get the right ingredients of the Lord in our life, things go a lot better. Amen? Things go so much smoother when we have the ingredients of the Lord. Uh, Steve and Nutcher, will you come over here? I'm going to give you a, something to read now. As I said, now we had planned to do this totally different, but I didn't get the call from the pastor yesterday. All right, would you read the next two paragraphs here, sir? Sure. He's going to read the next two paragraphs from that day. In Colossians 1.29, there is a very interesting insight into the way Paul sees his relationship with God in this work. He says that he is struggling, but with the power of God. The Greek word translated labor means to grow weary, to work to the point of exhaustion, this word was used particularly of athletes as they train. The word for struggle, which comes next, can mean in some languages to agonize. So we have the same word picture of an athlete training with everything to win. But then God adds, uh, Paul adds a twist to the idea because Paul is straining not with everything he has, but with everything that God gives him. So we are left with a simple conclusion about God, Paul's ministry. It was a ministry done with great personal effort and discipline, but done with God's power. This relationship works in exactly the same way as we pursue the development of Christ's character in us. Amen. You get that? Christ's character has to be in us. We have to have, when we are to be transformed, we're to be like Him. 
If we're going to follow him, we have to be like him. Brother Mike, Brother Mike, come up here, sir. I got one. <laughs> Mike's going to read the last paragraph on, that, on Monday. Monday? Mm -hmm. This is important to remember because we live in a world in which we want more and more with less and less effort. That idea has crept into Christianity too. Some in Christian evangelists promise that if you just believe the Holy Spirit will fall upon you with amazing supernatural power and perform great miracles. But this can be dangerous. This can be a dangerous half truth because it can lead people to the conclusion that we just need to wait for God's power to come while we are sitting comfort comfortably in our seats. It's important to remember, we live in a world, don't we, of decisions. And with those decisions comes struggles. And there will be struggles in your life. Sister Melody, if you get ready, come on up. Sister Melody is going to do Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday lesson. And uh, she's one of our teachers at the church. And I've asked her since the other two churches backed out on me. <laughs> they really didn't back out. They did so I'm just going to turn it over to her, and uh, God bless you, Sister Bella. Let me get my stuff out of your way. Okay, you don't tell me when to stop? About 20 minutes. Well, we'll, we'll let you know when to stop. Okay. When they start walking around. <laughs> okay, you go. Good morning, church. There's a nice rock back here so I can stand on it. Um, well, this lesson was incredible, and um, this in the crucible with Christ, so it's a whole new way of looking at things, what I've been getting from it, is that when I'm going through trials, tribulations, or problems, or tough times, that it's part of my growing process and helping me to get closer to God. And um, so it's actually a gift, and it's something for me to be happy about and have joy. And like, it's so easy to fall into that space of, uh, you know, the victim, poor me, or we want to tell somebody, I, I want to tell somebody about the problems I'm going through, and then they can relate to it, and then they can tell me about the problems that they've been through, and then we can commiserate together. But instead, it's like, okay, wait a second. Jesus went through troubles, and all he went through the troubles are is because he told the truth. And I think it's really important that um, Roy just talked about it's telling the truth. So sometimes I'm not going to be popular when I tell the truth, or people aren't going to like to hear the truth. And sometimes I don't tell the truth, or we don't tell the truth, because we don't want to hurt someone's feelings, or we don't want them to get upset with us, or not be friends with us anymore. And um, so, but it's really important, because that's what Jesus went through, and that's the troubles that he went through. So if we go over to um, Tuesday, and it says, the disciplined will. And so it says, one of the greatest enemies of our wills is our own feelings. So sometimes our feelings aren't always the best indicator. We are increasingly living in a culture bombarded with pictures and music that can appeal directly to our senses, triggering our emotions, anger, fear, or lust, without our realizing it. How often do we think things such as, what do I feel like eating for supper? What do I feel like doing today? Do I feel good about buying this? Feelings have thus become intimately involved in our decision making. Feelings are not necessarily bad, but how I feel about something may have little to do with what is right or best. Indeed, our feelings can lie to us. The heart is, this, this verse is so important. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things. So what is that saying? My heart is deceitful to myself? How could that be possible? Because even in, we see that saying like, oh, follow your heart. But when it says follow our heart, should we check it and see what, if it's going along with God's will and his word? And so it, said, um, so it says, um, you can create a false picture of reality, causing us to make bad choices, setting us up for a crucible of our own making. 
Which brings us to another point within this lesson is that sometimes when we're in the crucible, right, the crucible is I'm in a tough spot, right? I'm going through the heat. I'm going through a problem. I'm going through something tough. There's two choices. Either I'm a victim of something that happened because other people have choices, right? And I live in a sinful world. Or it's because of something I did and I brought it on myself. So when I look at those two different ways, and so sometimes following my heart or following other people gets me in the crucible. So then it says, what example can you find from the Bible where people made choices based on feelings rather than on God's word? What were the consequences? So we look at Genesis 3.6. And what is in Genesis 3.6? It's an, oh, an Eve. You want to take a look at that? So it says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that is that it was pleasing to the eye, hey, that fruit looks good. And a tree to be desired to make one wise, oh wow, that tree's gonna make me know everything? That tree is like amazing. It looks good, I'm gonna know everything. And she did eat. She took the fruit and she did eat. And, it gave, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he ate too. So what did Eve's choice, what happened from Eve's choice? I can't hear. <laughs> Randy says she ate us out of house and home. So basically her decision caused the whole human race to fall and they lived in a perfect garden. They had a perfect relationship with God and they were perfect. Made in God's own image. One decision. That fruit looks good. I want it. I'm not going to listen to what God told me. I want it. That was a big choice that had a big repercussion. Then if we go to um, Samuel 11, 2, 4, 2 through 4. I'm not so, so sure it was so much the fruit. The temptation that Satan offered her there was that God was withholding something good from her. Uh, and, you know, she was told all the trees, just imagine that all the trees around here, God said you can eat all of them, all of them, except this one, it's mine. And don't touch it. Don't go near it, he told her. And, uh, but Satan convinced her that that, that was the one thing that she, that that uh, that was the best for her, and God had, was withholding it from her, and she 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 didn't trust God, and I think that's when we get in trouble too. I mean, not, there's she's no different. We keep those things there. We we've done the same thing. We 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 don't trust Him, and we probably do it on a daily basis. Definitely, Melanie. Yes. Um, I think it also has to do with the fact that she saw Satan was in that one tree and he was talking. So she knew that it had made the snake wise. So she wanted to be wise too. Good point. Any other comments? So hey. any other comments? Okay, so let's go to Samuel, because then this is what's so great about it, that we can go to the Bible, and we have other people that went before us, and we can learn from what they did. So if we have Samuel 2, 11, 2 Samuel, sorry, 11, 2 through 4. Will someone read that? Go ahead, Bill. 
And it came to pass at eventide that David rose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. So what happened? He violated Bathsheba. Taken her when she wasn't his. And what were the repercussions of that? So, go ahead, Pastor. Testing. Okay. Well, uh, he changed the trajectory of Bathsheba's life, and he also took the life of Uriah the Hittite. Hello? So justice, in God's eyes, was that if he took the life of Uriah the Hittite, the consequence would be that a life would be taken from someone he cared about. So he lost his pastor said that he lost his son so he caused the death of the um, Bathsheba's husband and then his son died and so there's two deaths there right because he went with a feeling and when Eve went with a feeling and didn't listen to God and disobeyed the whole human race fell into sin so we can see how following our heart sometimes and disobeying God can have major repercussions and put, put other people into a crucible. Um, okay, so let's go to Galatians 2, 11 and 12. These are some really good examples, aren't they? Does someone have a Gal Galatians and we'll read that? Is what it was? And when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him in a pace, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them, which were of the circumcision. So what is that saying? He played favorites, Pastor says. And also, it's like, then think about it. His own people, the Jews, came, the circumcised ones, the one that had all the law, and they had all the, this is what you have to do. When they came, he's like, oh, I can't be with those Gentiles. They're going to give me a hard time. What are they going to say? Are they going to kick me out? Am I going to be chastised? Am I going to be shunned from them? So it was okay when they weren't around, but... When, 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 um, when his own people came, then he, he didn't talk to the Gentiles. And he's like, I can't be around them. So his choices were made because of emotions or feelings, not what was, was right. So we can see these three examples. They really, they weren't doing things according to God's will, and there was repercussions for it. Go ahead, Pastor. I very much appreciate what you're saying, and, and I totally agree. Um, we see that the Pharisees and the Jews had, had the entire list of good things that they could do, and they followed it to a T, at least in word and action. But their desires, the heart that you're talking about, was still the same. They had not allowed Jesus to plant within them a new heart and give them new desires, and even new feelings that I've, I've experienced myself. And I think that's something I want to bring up, that if we... We know when we're giving over ourselves to decisions and actions and words that come from our sinful heart. And we know when we're giving ourselves over to those things that come from a heart being transformed by God. Because in my experience, it's not just, oh, this is my evil desire in here, but I'm trying to counter it with all my actions. It's actually God 
producing good desires in my heart and good feelings and good thoughts and me carrying those out in the real world. And so I guess that's what it looks like for me. I don't think feelings are the enemy. I think feelings that go against God's character yes. are the enemy. That's what I want to say. Perfect. Because feelings can be a good thing, a good indication. Is that what you're saying? So if, I, if God is in our heart, then what comes from our heart is going to be a good thing, the feelings. Is that what it is? Roy, do you have a question or are you giving a time? Time. Okay. Well, we have a couple more days here. Wednesday, radical commitment. So it sounds like if I can't trust my heart or sometimes and it, I have to check it with God's word, to have that radical commitment, I just want to read this text to you. It says, if your right eye causes you to stumble gouge it out and throw it away it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell so it's saying basically commit to god stay focused on god and anything that causes me to go away from god or to be distracted from god or not do what's right or his will get rid of it because he's not really saying oh go take out my eye right but if my eye is caught like what I thought, and it's the hand, remember? It's the eye or the hand. So it's what do I see? Because we see all kinds of things around us. Is there something that's going to distract me from God that I see? And then hand is what I do, right? So eye has to do with the mind. And so what is going to come into my mind that's going to distract me from God? Or what is, oh, the butterflies come through here, don't they? Last year, I counted seven butterflies that came through. I thought it was so beautiful. Because butterflies are freedom and transformation, aren't they? And so then with the hand, it says, cut off your hand if it's going to cause you a problem or distraction from God. And that's from what I do. And that's my body. So between the eye and my mind and what I see to my hand to what I do. So that's what... Wednesday's lesson was about so to radically commit to God and not let anything come between him and I and what he has the mission for me to do or you to do and then Thursday is need perseverance do you all know the story of Jacob remember he sent he the whole thing he went through with Esau he stole the birthright he went he worked with Laban he got tricked and lied to he had one wife, then he had to work for the second wife that he really wanted. He had all these kids, and then he was sent back to his homeland. And he goes, i got to make things right with my brother. He had all this stuff, and so what did he say in his heart? I'll give you everything. I don't care. I want to make things right with my family. And so he took all of his possessions, all of his wives, all of his children, and he sent them, and they're coming through to the land where his brother is. And then he, he's like, I don't know how this is going to go. My, I heard my brother's coming with 400 men. He may just kill us all. And so then he, he did the most thoughtful thing he could possibly do. He divided them in two. And he says, you go this way, you go that way to, for protection. And then he sent all the people in front of him. But I really want to read this verse. It says, go to Genesis 32 and at 24. If we could just read that, because I think this is how we can tie this lesson together and how important this is. Genesis 32, 24, and it says, And Jacob was alone. So he did all the provisions to say, help protect everybody, right? And he's coming back to do the right thing. And then he's like, I'm going to need this time alone. And he, Jacob was alone. And there wrestled a man with him until daybreak the breaking of day and when he saw that he prevailed not against him he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob and thigh and was out of joint and as he wrestled with him and he said let me go so he's telling God is saying let me go for the day is breaking and he said I will not let thee go except thou bless me he fought for his blessing he said, I've done something wrong. I'm going to make it right. I'm doing everything I can to do it, make, make it right. And now, bless me. He fought for his blessing. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. 
for as a prince has for as a prince has thou power with God and will men and hast prevailed and Jacob asked him and said tell me I pray thee thy name and he said wherefore is it that thou dost ask for my name and he blessed him there and Jacob called the name of the place Peniel for I have seen God's face to face and my life is preserved so not only did he wrestle with God and he had to fight for that blessing he got a new name and he was transformed so sometimes we are in the crucible and we are going to go through tough times right but we fight we're going to fight for that blessing and we're going to go through those tough times so it's that basically telling us don't give up right don't give up and keep holding on and listening to god's word that's what i put in here and fight for his blessing and so how can we um how can we we can read bible verses to keep us focused on god and the it's in the holy word of god right he'll guide us he we can see the holy spirit he'll speak to us and he speaks to us with his holy word and other people um i just want to read this let me go um jacob's blessing came because he held it on through the pain so it so it is with us god also may dislocate our hip and then call us to hang on to him through our pain indeed god allowed the painful sears to continue jacob was still limping when he met his brother to outside appearances it was a weakness but for jacob it was an indication of his strength thank you Bucky, would you come up here? Thank you, Sister Melody. On Friday, I, I, I thought this was really interesting. I'm going to ask Bucky just to read there's, uh, what Ellen White says uh, in Patriarchs and Prophets. So, brother, if you read these two paragraphs, let's get over to the mic so they can hear you. This will that formed so important a factor in the character of man was at the fall given until the second control of Satan. And he has ever since been working in man to will and to do of his own pleasures, but to the utter and ruin and misery of man. That's Alan G. White Testimonies of the Church. In order to receive God's help, man must realize his weakness and deficiency. He must apply his own mind to the great change to be wrought in himself. He must be aroused to earnestly and preserving prayer and efforts. Wrong habits and customs must be shaken off, and it is only by deter determined endeavor to correct these errors and to conform to right principles that the victory can be gained. Many may, many never attain to the position that they might occupy because they wait for God to do for them that which he has given them power to do for themselves. All who are fitted for usefulness must be trained by the severest mental and moral discipline, and God will assist them by uniting divine power with human efforts. Ellen D. White, Patriarch and Prophets, page 248. Anybody have any comments on the lesson this morning? A little bit different. Anybody have any comments? Anything you'd like to add? All right. Pastor, would you stand and dismiss us in a word of prayer or Sabbath school? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we listen to the sound of the, the rushing waters behind us, 
Um, I just want to thank you for allowing us, even in this sinful and broken world, to experience your beauty, to experience your love. And I pray that when we do, and when we, when we know that you are the creator and you are the one who has already paid the price to save us, I pray that we will unite in this life with you, that we won't do it alone, that we'll choose to trust in you more and more each day, that we'll choose to listen to you and know that you will empower us to change, empower us to be better. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going right on with our regular service now. We're going to do our uh, personal ministries. Anybody like to share with us what you've done this week or recently for the Lord? Feel free. Just raise your hand up and that young man will bring you the microphone. Surely somebody done something for the Lord this week. All right. Oh, oh. Brother, one, young two. man, bring the mic check over here. One, Just two. Hang on. Test one, two. Test, check. Test, test. Thank you. I found a 90 year old guy that was hungry. He called me and he asked me if I was busy. And I said, no. And he said, would you fix me some supper, please? And I said, yes. Yeah. I took it to him. He got it. He's a real good guy, but sometimes he can't get around like he should or anything. But I pray to God he's in God's hands. Amen. Now, this young lady used to go with us to the Parsons Church when I was pastoring over there. And she got a hold of me last week. She says, Roy, can I go to church with you all? Well, I don't care. Yes. But what about your church? She says, they're going to close it. So I'm looking for a church. So we're real glad. So can you give her a hand for coming our way? Her name's Bonnie. We have two Bonnies now. So, all right. Anyone else? You want to share something with us? All right. There's Judy. I took and helped uh, take care of Aunt Betty and Uncle Bill's great-grandson, Briar. Okay. I'll tell you what happened to me the other night, if I may. Lois and I was coming home from Elkins, and I told her, I said, you know, I, I feel to go down to this one lady's house. Well, she said, let's go. We went down, and the woman, she says, Roy, I'm glad you're here. I said, well, what's the problem? She says, my kitchen sink is leaking all over. And I went in, I said, well, I can't fix it, but I can turn the water off, because she had somebody else coming later on who's going to fix it. So, you know, if we just... Go by how God tries to lead us. I think that'd be much better. Anyone else? Just raise your hand. All right, I'm just going to turn the program over to you or to Randy. Randy, you're the elder this week. I don't know if we have. Oh, here's Lois. Lois has got something to say. Yeah, Bonnie called me the other day to see if I was busy, and I took her to ha she had to have some tests run. Amen. Oh, by the way, let me tell you all this. You got me for at least the next 23 years. My doctor told me I'm going to live, I, I have to go to I'm 100. He said, I can't find nothing wrong with you. Well, my wife sort of said, well, he didn't check deep enough. <laughs> but uh, really, I uh, said my blood pressure's good, my cholesterol's good. My weight's good. Uh, everything else was good. So I just praise the Lord for that. All right, Brother Randy, I'm going to turn the service over to you. I've been asked to do a special song today, but before that, do we have a, how do we want to do our offering today, Bill? Huh? Just double up next week? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we could do that. Uh, if you got an offering you'd like to leave in the guitar case, I'll, Bill's our treasure here. I'll make sure he gets it and counts it and puts it in the right place uh, just pass it to Bill all right uh, did we have a scripture reading today 
We do? Okay. Uh, get that ready for me. And while we're doing that, I'll, how about prayer requests? Aunt Betty and Uncle Bill. Okay, yes, ma'am. Hazel. I couldn't hear her. Her lost loved ones. What a wonderful prayer. I think this thing's about to fall here. Uh, yeah. We all have lost loved ones, don't we? Children. Many of you probably know now I, I lost my daughter this week, and uh, it's been a real, real struggle. And uh, we need your prayers in a lot of ways. Boys need your prayers. Uh, it was real tough. God is with me. That's exactly right, Judy. We'll have her memorial service in Charleston Church next Sabbath uh, afternoon. I've asked Chris Trent to help me. Uh, so keep us in your prayers. Uh, anybody else? I want to remember my mother, too. We took her to the doctor and had some x-rays and stuff done this week. She's doing a little better. The bruises... Uh, where she fell was getting better, and and she's got to go back to the doctor Tuesday. Lois? Yeah, keep me in prayer. I had blood work done on my kidneys, and he has to have it repeated again in 30 days. Okay. So it's not looking too good. Lois's blood work. Well, we'll pray for your blood. Children, grandchildren, neighbors, and spoken. Oh, we got somebody from Zoom. Who was that? Who? Ruth Ann. Oh, Ruth. Okay, Ruth, are you going? You you going to be home later? We thought about maybe come a uh, few of us come by and visit you since we're down this way. Would that be all right, Ruth? Yeah, that'd be fine. Bring an offering. Bring an offering. There you go. <laughs> all righty. Okay. Anyone else have a prayer request? This is Pat on Zoom. Oh, Pat. I did find a few people who weren't watching. Barbara Wolford was so glad to hear she could get you on Zoom. So, Great. And so was Lisa Phillips. Well, we really appreciate sure Barry bringing the technology out here in the wilderness. It's wonderful. Well, that, so praise the Lord for that. And praise the Lord for my uh, only granddaughter who just graduated with magna cum laude, uh, you know, honors. Uh, in her master's degree and uh, that's just a praise and for for the rest of my family each one of them has their own problems including me I have I don't know what's ahead of me uh, for this knee problem so just keep us on your prayers like you say friends and everybody's prayer list yeah thank you Pat I appreciate all the cards I've got this week too uh, from church members, I I didn't really expect it. I appreciate that, Judy, and others that sent sympathy cards. And, uh, let's see, uh, who, uh, Sherry Lynn? Keep me in your prayers. Sherry uh, Lynn, we got you. I went up to the ER this week. Um, I have a cervical strain in my neck where somebody ran into the back of my car. Oh. Yeah, that can happen. Judy has another request over here. While Ju while that we're getting the microphone to Judy, you'd be thinking if uh, anyone else might have something they'd like to share with us. Pray for everybody in my family, especially with my sister Karen. She's having a real hard time with Mikey's death. Yes. So pray for all my family that they'll come to Jesus before it's too late. Amen. And also keep me in your prayers that I'll be a better Christian. Amen. We all want to be better Christians, don't we? My wife's got her hand up back here, Susan. I couldn't hear what she was saying. So. She don't like a microphone, but <laughs> I can't hear you. Shatra. Oh, yeah, we're about to uh, have our uh, first great-grandbaby, and um, it could come really at any day. Uh, so remember, everything looks good right now. Baby looks healthy. We're all excited, uh, but we want him to be here on time and God's time. Uh, anyone else? All righty, if you would, just uh, Melanie. 
Hang, hang on, I got Melanie, and then I'll get to the Zoom call. I have a bunch of information they sent me about a to do a health um, a health Sabbath, and there's um, some magazines that we can hand out, and it's all about how to handle stress and um, mental health, and I think that's really important in today's world. And so I just would like prayer for us all to be able to be disciples. And um, so I'm going to order some, some of these magazines, and then we can just hand them out. And then they gave me a sermon that we can listen to that helps um, show us how to utilize these, this great um, the, this literature. So I, I pray for to carry the health message um, because there's other people that want to quit smoking, and we have a lot of information. And so I contacted this woman that has a quit smoking program. So for all the outreach that our church can do and reach people that um, are searching. So I, I pray that we get the right information and that we facilitate all of this um, and send the right people. Yeah, Melanie and I were talking about that a little this week, about spiritual gluttony. And I'm going to try to work up a message about it. Uh, and because uh, sometimes we come to church just to eat. You know, we want to be fed. We don't even like that preacher. He don't feed me right. But we're not there to be fed. We're there to feed. We should be reaching out. It should be outreach ministry. Jesus was all about outreach. So I don't want to get, get to preaching as a pastor. <laughs> but but we'll, go. we'll go with that another day. Uh, but uh, see, somebody online there. Who was it? Lisa. Lisa. Yeah, it's Robin Lisa here. We just wanted our prayer list. Um, Mitch had a trip to Chicago, and it was a safe trip, but he came back and he got COVID. So I just pray for he and his family. And uh, Jamie's still having some health issues. Um, she was recently in the hospital with her heart, and so she's still having issues. But we just pray for all of our children and grandchildren and uh, just our prayer list, please. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Let's go back to Lois. Anybody else online get uh, staged up? We're going to Lois here. Oh, go, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Jerry's got the microphone. so I have a recheck on my cancer coming up this next week, and I, I pray for uh, that it'll come out. That hey. It hasn't come back. Amen. All righty. We'll take the microphone to Lois. I keep my grandson in prayer, Cody, <clears throat> the one that lives in Baltimore. Yeah. He got COVID. He has a brain damage, and he told his mom, he's, I'm so sorry I caught COVID. Yeah, isn't that something? <laughs> but he's 25 years old, and he acts like he might be seven or eight. You folks are welcome to join us. This is Judy. We need to pray for uh, Darlene's daughter-in-law and grandkids. They're yeah. traveling. She had to go out of state. Yeah, I'm gonna. My son, we put him on the airplane last night to Tampa, Florida. He ended up in another city in Florida. the The flight was uh, in midair. They couldn't land in Tampa, so. But he got home sooner, but now he's got to go back to Tampa and get his car, which he had rent, rental there a couple hours away. But it was a safe flight, and uh, that's what we prayed for. Anyone else? Anyone else on Zoom? Okay, let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you today for... Go ahead. Watch him online. Yes. I'm sorry. Father, we thank you today for your beautiful day that you've given us. Uh, the forecast wasn't so good there for a while, but just look at this. It's beautiful sunshine, beautiful day. We just pray that we put a smile upon your hearts with all we do and say today, and that our worship would be a sweet savor, a sweet incense that would go up. Father, pur purify our hearts today. Uh, take away any chafe that might be there, that something that don't belong there. Father, give us wisdom to become more like you. Give us the power. You promised us that power. Help us not to get in your way. And 
Help us to allow you to change us each and every day. Father, those requests that were made this morning, I just pray that you would uh, be upon each and every one uh, as according to your will. Father, sometimes we don't know what to pray, but we're told that the Holy Spirit would make utterings, and we just we just thank you for that because sometimes we're running around here lost and blind. Father, give us eyes to see, spiritual eyes, that we could follow you in all ways. In Jesus' name we pray, and amen. Okay, Let's see if we can get that other microphone up here. Maybe I can use it with the guitar. Who's got the microphone? I don't know if you folks realize it back there. We're standing on some rocks here, and they're rocky. Are they? I know it. I know what Roy's talking about. Now, Roy's been a holy roller, but I never have. There we go. I'm not so sure I can stand on those rocks. We'll try it. But... Uh, while he's getting that microphone adjusted up, and I appreciate his help here, uh, the uh, if you th if you think you've heard this song before, you may have. Uh, it was requested that I do it today, and um, but some of you may not know this song's got a special meaning to me. I was I took a part time job moving tractor and trailers on the weekend. That was my job during the week years ago. And they called me the first weekend and I said, I can't go. And they said, well, why not? And I said, I'm drunk. They called me the second weekend. And can you go, I think it was to Parkersburg or somewhere to deliver a truck. I wish I could, but I can't. Well, why not? I'm drunk. The third weekend they called me. And it got, it, it got me thinking. So I kind of looked back through my life. There wasn't a year, there wasn't a weekend in seven years that I wasn't drunk. Why did I even tell them I was going to take that job? There was no way. Uh, but God come in my life and changed me. Um, two, I lost all my friends. I know what Roy's talking about. I mean, and it's really sad that he lost Christian friends. Uh, but when I decided to follow God, I had to leave them all behind. Now, a few of them has come on, come in along the way and thank God for them. Uh, and the other ones, you know, they thought, well, you know, that'll pass. He'll, he'll get over that Christianity stuff. It, it never passed. 20-some uh, years now or more and I'm still following the Lord and but that now many of them have the utmost respect for me now because I stuck it out you know and it means a lot this perseverance she was talking about uh, you know the change that had in my life was permanent uh, and I'm thank God for it Now and then, a friend of mine will stop by sometime, and they'll ask me where have I been, what's on my mind. They wonder why I'm not drinking. And painting this old town red I tell them I'm serving Jesus now And the old man is dead 
the man you see before you may look a lot the same I may wear those same clothes have the same old name but if you're looking on the outside you should see inside instead you'd see I'm a brand new man cause the old man is dead I used to live such a wicked life I had no hope inside I was lost in the darkness Searching for the light Then one night in a little church After hearing what the preacher said I give my heart to Jesus Now the old man is dead The man you see before you May look a lot the same I may wear those same old clothes Have the same old name But if you're looking on the outside You should see inside instead You'd see I'm a brand new man Cause the old man is dead And if you're looking on the outside You should see inside instead You'd see I'm a brand new man For the old man Amen. All righty. What scripture reading do we have, Pastor? Psalm 111, verse 10. Psalm 111, verse 10. You got your Bibles, you can turn with me. I'll give you just a minute. Let's look up Psalms 11, verse 10. 111. That's where I'm at, 111 verse 10. No matter what I said, that's where I'm at. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all that, that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Come share with us. Let's see if I can get this out of your way. Don't fall in the creek. Thanks, Randy. <laughs> Might be kind of refreshing to fall in the creek. Ah, oh, it's a good morning, isn't it? We prayed for a miracle and God did a miracle. Amen. Hallelujah for that. We trusted in Him. He came through for us. Okay, I don't know whether to stand on this rock or not. I know I'm on the rock of Jesus, but I'm going to move this one away. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. Always stand on the rock. Thank you for that message to me, Jerry. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay, I want to start out by praying. Let's, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this beautiful day. Um, I want to thank you for constantly reminding me how good you are and how powerful you are to do real things, not just in our world, but in my life. And so this morning, Jesus, I want to thank you for giving me this message. I want to pray that it's not me who speaks my opinions, but that everything that I say will be straight from you and what you have convicted me of and put in my heart. Hide me behind your cross, and may your love, may your character shine forth today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 
This is interesting. I can barely hear myself. <laughs> it's good, though. Maybe that's, maybe that's good. Helps me trust in God. Have you guys ever had a phobia before? Raise your hand if you had a phobia or an irrational fear of something. Okay. Call some of them out. What were your phob phobias, your fears? Spiders? Oh, you better watch out, Jerry. I just saw one hanging up here. <laughs> Salamanders? Why? Because they're all uh, slick and smaller. I guess it's irrational, so just salamanders. <laughs> Because they're salamanders. Snakes. Yeah. Snakes. Well, I don't see any snakes, Bonnie. Where you came from? I know there are a lot of snakes where I came from, too. The land down under. We have plenty of spiders and snakes down there. What other fears do you have? What did you say, Randy? Claustrophobia. Now, that's one I relate to. Anyone ever been caving before? Well, I've been caving. The first time I went caving... I got stuck, and I'm claustrophobic, so I started to freak out, I had to take deep breaths. You, you feel what I'm feeling, Randy? And uh, praise the Lord, they got me up out of there, and then God helped me get the strength to go back down again, and I made it that time. I contorted myself in the right way. But uh, yeah, uh, claustrophobia for me. Um, who, who's scared of heights? Raise your hand who's scared of heights. That's a big one for me. That's a big phobia that I adopted. Probably a lot from my mom. She's scared of heights too. We have some fears in this life. And you know, the Bible, it's not silent on this topic of fear. Did you know that the word for fear in Hebrew and Greek was used over 500 times in the Bible? How many times? 500 times in the Bible. So it's no surprise to God that that is something we struggle with as human beings. And there are many reasons why. And I think they're all valid reasons. But I want to I focus on one particular instance this morning where that word fear is used. And so, despite what we read for our, our scripture, I want you to turn to Revelation 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. Revelation chapter 14, and verse 7. Rela Revelation is the last book of the Bible. Chapter 14 is basically right in the middle. Just a bit over that. Chapter 14, verse 7. And I'm going to read it. I'm going to start from verse 6. What are these? What am I reading? The three angels. Messages. Okay, good. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven. And mid-heaven is the space. It's not God's heaven. It's not the earthly sky. It's between that. So we're technically speaking about space, space right now. Having an eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth. What was, what was he preaching? Eternal gospel. A good news to every person who lives on earth. Every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, what? Fear God and give Him glory or give importance or weight to Him because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. So we see the first angel's messages calling people back to a true worship of spirit and truth toward God. And part of the, the statement that this angel makes in inviting people to worship God is that we should fear God. That we should fear God. The words for fear in the Greek and Hebrew are used in various different ways throughout the Bible. You have to really look at the context which is being spoken in to find out what exactly it's referring to. It's because the, uh, the Hebrews especially had a very limited vocabulary compared to English. But I want to focus on two different meanings and connotations of the word for fear in the Bible because I think this is, this is vital to us and I think you'll find that it's vital as we read. So we find the first instance or connotation of, of uh, fear here in Revelation 14.7 but I think we also see it in Psalm 33. So turn to me, Psalm 33 verse 8. 
Psalms chapter 33, verse 8. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quick fire for the sake of time. Psalms 33, verse 8. And it reads, Let all the earth... Oh, by the way, uh, David in the Psalms likes to juxtapose two ideas. So he'll state something, and then he'll state the same idea again, but in different terminology. And here we find one of those ways. Verse 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in what? In awe of God. Him, for he spoke and it was done. It was this, the, the creative power that was being referred to again that God had. So we see this word for fear used in Revelation 14, 7, Psalm 33. We see that it means reverence. It means awe. It means seeing something as, as big and powerful and, uh, and high up in rank, respectable. It means to admire something, to appreciate, to venerate to honor, to put in high regard. I want to ask you guys a question. What kind of things do you stand in awe of in this life, practically? What makes you go, wow, in your life? Huh? God's what? God's commu community? Beauty. God's beauty. We're right here in the middle of it. You look up into the trees. You look at the river, the power of the rapids behind me. You look at the birds fly through the air and you just think, wow, wow, what a powerful God we serve. Yeah, Randy. The human body. Isn't it? I totally agree with you, Randy. Sometimes I, sometimes I take a step back, I look at my hands and I'm like, how did God even think of my hands? Like, what, what are they even for? <laughs> They're crazy. I mean, why, why do we have five little things sticking out of my hands? And how is my, my body operating the way it's operating with all these different components, all the same? Wow. I stand in awe of how God did that. Hazel, you have something else? You're just praising the Lord. Amen. Jerry, go ahead. Life. The first time you had your firstborn. Wow. And I'm excited to experience that. Yeah. Sam? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, you stand in awe of, of how God blessed us with the, the power to reproduce life. And that's an, another person that you are holding. Wow, that's incredible. It's awe, it's reverence, it's seeing the power, it's seeing the beauty in something. It's appreciating. It's holding in high regard. It's things that make us go, wow, wow. And I'd put to you that this is a healthy fear that we have. And this is what the fear in Psalm 33, Revelation 14 is pointing us to. It's natural for us humans to feel, especially in the face of something so unimaginably extraordinary and powerful. It reminds me of just uh, two days ago. I had to drive through that big storm that came through. Do you guys remember the big storm on Thursday? I had to drive about two and a half hours through that storm back and forth. And, you know, at, at times I felt more, maybe more of an un, unhealthy fear. I felt in danger. But most of the time I felt just like, wow, the power of this storm. I saw, I saw so many, like, visible lightning strikes cross the sky and the thunder shook the car. And I was just like, wow, this is so cool. <laughs> at, at the same time that I'm kind of scared I, of the rain, you know, I can't really see much. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so cool. The power of this storm. To think there is some being more powerful than this storm. Wow. Wow. I was in awe of the storm's power. This is, I believe strongly, the fear that Revelation 14 and verse 7 is talking about. We should give honor. We, we, yeah, go ahead, Randy. <laughs> he actually spoke to that mighty storm with a word, and it was still. Wow, so that's even more awe-inspiring than the storm itself, that someone could come up against that and just beat it in the blink of an eye. Woo! That gets me excited. Wow. Wow. Then that's the healthy fear I think God wants us to have of Him, to see how powerful He is. Do you, do you realize how 
how small we are in this universe? Do you realize how big space is? I'm not going to give you all the statistics. It'll, it'll boggle your mind. But space is humongous. It is absolutely vast and beautiful. And we serve a God that breathed that into existence. Does that not inspire you with that type of fear and awe? And just like, wow, I am so little here. <laughs> I'm so very little. This morning, I want to also address another type of fear, which I think is a result of sin and I don't think is healthy one bit when it comes to our relationship with God. There's another type of fear mentioned in the Bible. It's an unhealthy type of fear towards God that is created and triggered by sin. Much of the time, the fear we have toward God isn't just awe and reverence. It isn't just acknowledgement of His power and of His importance. Sometimes, if you're anything like me and had the same upbringing that I have, sometimes we are truly worried, scared, frightened, or anxious at the idea of God. Like He poses some kind of threat or danger to our holistic well-being. We think maybe that sometimes He's angry at us and wants to hurt us because of His anger. Maybe you think, oh, God is trying to teach me a lesson I'll never forget, and He's real angry at me right now. Many people today, Christians and non-Christians, struggle with actual terror and fear towards God. They're truly scared of Him. Do you know that? They truly don't understand who He is. They're truly scared of Him. Maybe they don't say it to you. Maybe we don't say it to each other. But our actions, our attitudes, they reflect that belief in a big way. And this is what I believe is one of the biggest reasons that people today do not choose to know God and they do not choose to come to church. They are afraid. They are truly terrified of the idea of God that has been painted in their mind. And so that brings me to the second meeting in the Bible of fear. And I think we find an example of that in 2 Chronicles. If you'll turn to me to 2 Chronicles. Oh man. Help, help the rain to stop, Lord. No, you can do it. 2 Chronicles 20, 29. Say amen when you're there. 2 Chronicles 20, 29. You there? Good. 2 Chronicles. And if, if it starts to rain, we can always go on to shelter. 2 Chronicles 20, 29. Just let me know if you guys are getting too wet and uncomfortable and we'll, we'll move. 20, 29. And the dread of God was in all the kingdoms of the lands when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. So they, they, they saw God's power, but they're also scared for their life. They're scared for their life. Let's go on to the pavilion. Let's go on to the pavilion. I'll meet you there. And uh, I'll leave the mic with Barry. This doesn't get wet. That sounds like a <laughs> some kind of space thing. Oops. Sorry, Vladka. Thank you. Do you want to put this underneath too? It said about one that it would it could come. Oh yeah? Okay, well I'll, I'll hang this up. It's okay. 